And welcome back to the show. Womankind is an organization that's providing multilingual and culturally responsive services to help survivors of domestic violence, human trafficking, and sexual violence rise above trauma and build a path towards healing. Now, through their programs, they offer survivors access to a safe place to live, as well as counseling, legal assistance, and so much more. But joining us now and sharing more, we are pleased to have the Chief Executive Officer of Womankind, Yasmin Hamsa, and uh, she shares with us now. And Yasmin, I, I thank you for joining us. And when we talk about life, particularly for women uh, that you deal with, um, it really centers a lot about abuse. And uh, can you give us a little insight into how difficult it is for a lot of these women who've really suffered uh, under this kind of abuse? Yes. Well, thank you so much, first and foremost, for having us today. Um, so yeah, a lot of the survivors that we work with um, have experienced some sort of, sort of gender-based violence. And, and the work that we do works really across the lifespan. So it's working with you know, children and youth who have experienced different forms of gender-based violence all the way to older adults, um, recognizing that individuals who experience different forms of trauma at different points of their life may need different things. Um, and so the far majority of the survivors that we work with are often immigrant survivors who um, are new to the country or have been here for a while. Um, and so really being able to figure out ways to support them in figuring out what their path is, whether it's to leave an abusive relationship or to just talk to somebody and, and kind of seek a better understanding of what the resources are that are available. And so the way that we're able to really do and support survivors is through um, providing support through, I guess, two different ways. One, we have an emergency residence, we call it residence, but they're emergency shelters that are really able to support survivors for a period of time um, that are leaving an abusive relationship to really kind of figure out what their next steps are. Um, the goal of, of, of the work that we do is to create a space, a space of community for those survivors as they're really kind of engaging on that path. So it's providing counseling, it's providing information, referrals, helping them obtain um, housing, which is often extremely difficult for survivors in New York City. Um, you know, for some, it's it's learning how to use the subway system, learning English, um, and really kind of helping support them in that period of time um, while they're in our houses. But we recognize that in order to really address issues of gender-based violence within our community, we also really have to do the work with and in the community. And so in addition to our emergency houses and our residences, we have three community sites that are really in um, Asian enclaves. So in Brooklyn and Manhattan mm -hmm. and Queens, where survivors who maybe have not left an, an, uh, an abusive relationship or have, but are living within the community can come in and access services and support. Um, and what does that look like really? It's, it's very similar to what happens in our houses, you know, counseling. Um, one of the things that I think uh, we also do is um, we are a culturally specific organization that's focused on um, AAPI, Asian and uh, Asian Pacific Islander survivors of gender-based violence, but we're open to serving anybody that walks through our doors is really taking wellness practices that are already part of our cultures and our communities and integrating that into the work that we do. Um, so in addition to the counseling and the legal services um, and, you know, supporting around economic empowerment, we're also able to integrate wellness support as well in supporting them on their path. Um, one piece um, that we also have is our 24-hour helpline that features a text and chat feature, um, which allows survivors to access us um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a multitude of Asian languages, as well as Spanish, to really kind of um, talk to someone to figure out what their next steps may be, what resources are available. It's a space that family members and professionals can call. Um, but we implemented our text and chat feature actually prior to COVID, which was amazing for us just because it was another opportunity for during COVID where survivors were sheltering in place that they could access us without having to talk. And it's both in English and in Chinese. Yeah, you talked about COVID and I can jump in here and talk a little bit about understanding, uh, talked with a lot of people in the service industry who said, listen, particularly during COVID, it became a time when we were uh, seeing increased numbers, increased services, uh, the need, the demand was out there, but yet and still we didn't have the staff to be able to keep up. 
uh, when we talk about uh, abuse, uh, we knew that abuse became even more prevalent uh, during times of COVID. Uh, what was it like for you, your staff, and being able to really transition and pivot uh, for the needs of your clients? So, you know, I will say um, I'm fortunate to work alongside amazing, you know, amazing community within Womankind who pivoted really quickly. Our residential staff continued to work in the houses day in and day out. Um, and we took all the necessary precautions to be able to continue to support our survivors as they were sheltering in place, um, as well as our staff who worked within our community sites worked to transition all of our services into remote. Um, but if there were needs for survivors in person, we continued. What we actually saw at the beginning of the pandemic was a decrease in service calls. Um, and I think that was due to the fact that people were having difficulty in being able to access services or know where to go. But what we did see was an increase in need of our current client base. Um, and as the pandemic went on, we did see an increase in calls to our helpline and to our text and chat. Um, but what we saw was there was an increase in food insecurity, an increase in job loss, um, and you know the impact of abuse was um, taking a toll on individuals' mental health. Um, they were sheltering in place with people who were potentially harming them, um, and oftentimes, you know, resources and supports that they had historically been able to use, such as the court system, were closed. And so, you know, our staff really kind of figured out different ways to support survivors whether it was sitting on the phone with them, helping them fill out a food stamp application, which historically they would have done together in person, or it was, you know, for our older survivors, it was actually sitting and talking them through how to use Zoom or be able to kind of go to their doctor's appointments via, you know, a virtual session um, and really sort of figuring out ways to help them around food insecurity, getting them resources. Um, our staff really kind of came together to figure out what's available. How do we get it out to our survivors? and what are ways that we can continue to provide the support. So that included having our group work and our wellness work virtually and sending survivors some of the tools that they may need to be able to engage in that. And so, you know, it was being creative in the ways in which we were able to support survivors, but recognizing that the needs of survivors hadn't really changed. They were just really exacerbated um, by the pandemic. And so we needed to continue to be able to respond and recognizing that these needs are not as short-term like it's not just that these needs are not just happening during the pandemic, but they'll continue and will have ripple effects. Um, and so how do we continue to support and, um, you know, create our services in a way that continues to meet the needs of our community members? Yeah, I, I want to talk about one of the needs that you have, and that is to be able to deal with a multiplicity of different women who come from different backgrounds and most of all different languages. And so uh, multilingual support uh, is definitely needed. Um, how have you been able to deal with that given the fact that uh, you have this great uh, diversity of people who are your clients? So we are intentional in, in bringing on staff that come from the communities that we serve as well as are able to speak the language. Um, and so one of the things that we do is work to ensure that any survivor that walks through the door are linked to advocates that speak their language. Um, if we don't have that language, we find a resource to be able to support the survivor. Um, but being a multilingual organization has been at, it's, it's from the foundation, it was why we were created um, in the first place. And so it's, it's something that we continue to ensure that we're able to do, right? Looking for resources within our communities that meet our clients' linguistic needs, making sure that some of the stuff that we're able to provide is in their preferred language. And I think a big part of what we do in addition to the service piece is language access um, and language justice and, and really advocating to ensure that systems that are required by law um, to provide services to our survivors in their preferred language are actually doing that. Um, so in addition to that direct work, um, we are you know, in spaces to be able to advocate to ensure that the barriers oftentimes that our survivors have and being able to access services due to language um, that we're addressing them and, and that we are ensuring that our clients have those rights that they're entitled to. You brought up the word barriers and you were leading right into where I want to go because I want to talk a little bit about what are some of those barriers that, we're see that you're seeing out there that you're facing that can really make the work more impactful, but uh, these barriers that are particularly here in New York City. 
so like I said, I think for immigrant survivors, language has, I feel like I've been saying language access for such a long time now, um, because that continues to be a barrier. Not being able to be able to access a service in your preferred language makes it difficult to be able to get resources, whether it's being able to access public assistance or mental health services, or even housing, um, you know, shelter services. Um, another barrier that we continue to see is housing. Um, there's not enough affordable housing in New York City to be able to support survivors. Um, in addition to that, the access to the resources that exist are oftentimes hard or, or take quite a while to be able to access. And there's barriers, um, you know, um, in filling out the paperwork and how long that takes. And that creates ripple effects on survivors' abilities to really be able to um, you know, lead the path that they want. Um, and so, you know, uh, those tend to be barriers. I think just systems in, in general, um, the difficulty in being able to access a resource sometimes. Um, I can tell you as an English language, somebody that speaks English, um, I have difficulty understanding some of the applications and so forth. And recognizing that survivors of gender-based violence are not just coming to services with like organizations such as ours, but have to access the school system, have to access the housing system, have to access the public assistance system, the court system, um, and so many different systems and like being able to support them in, in the different barriers that each system poses to be able to access support. Yeah. Well, I want to tell people Yasmin is the CEO of Womankind. And uh, listen, for you, it's a 40 year anniversary coming up, uh, an opportunity to celebrate the work that's going on. Talk to us about your 40th year anniversary and the celebration. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Womankind was created in 1982 by a group uh, made up of a social work student and a student and different activists within the community that recognize um, that really nothing existed at the time that supported survivors, um, particularly Asian survivors of gender-based violence. Um, and we've grown tremendously over the years to be able to incorporate different services and supports in different languages. But I think the, the foundation of why we existed continues, um, you know, and we, all of us now stand on, you know, the shoulders of all of those amazing advocates who really were at the forefront of that time um, during the women's movement and created something that was incredible. I'd like to say at 40 years, I wish we didn't exist because that meant gender-based violence had been addressed within our communities. But you know, I think um, we're excited this year about being able to continue the work, you know, really kind of focusing in on continuing to really amplify the voices of our survivors, ensuring that they're at the tables where decisions are being made that impact them. Um, really ensuring that um, we're addressing the systematic barriers that are oftentimes um, impacting communities of color in particular, and really being able to think about what is it that we need to do to deepen our work to be able to support survivors in the ways that they want, right? Um, a lot of how we were built and how we continue to kind of be is we work alongside our communities and listen to our communities. Our programs are shifted and shaped based on what we're hearing of what they need. Um, and that's something we'll continue to do, you know, in our 40th year. Um, but we're just, you know, really excited about, you know, where we've gone and, and what the future holds for us um, and really continue to be committed to addressing gender-based violence and really working alongside our communities to address, um, you know, the issues around social justice, around you know, talking with our communities and working alongside of our communities to really kind of rise above violence and address those issues head on. And so as you talk about 40 years, we talk about the fact of an organization had to be here to deal with the needs that are occurring out there, the abuse, the things of that nature. That, and and I'm, I guess the point that I'm making is years ago, that voice was muted. And when we look now, it seems as though the voice of survivors and those who encountered abuse have a lot more support and a lot more wraparound services and more listening ears. As you look and project for where you're trying to go, uh, what can the community better do to assist in being, uh, assist you in being a credible messenger and not just a credible messenger, but also by providing some supportive services to some of your clients who are some of the most beautiful people, but yet and still find themselves on the other side of abuse? 
So I think, you know, what is it <clears throat> that community can do? I think community is already do, is doing some of, you know, the work and we're really just working alongside of them. I think, you know, when the organization started, no one talked, like you said, about <clears throat> domestic violence or sexual violence. And we're at a place where people are talking about it. Um, <clears throat> but it's that continuing conversation, looking at ways that community can kind of work to address it not just the systems that, you know, not just the criminal legal system, but what are ways we as communities can really kind of come together and talk about the issues and find ways to come up with innovative solutions to address them outside of maybe, um, you know, the different systems that oftentimes create barriers for survivors. I think community members continue to elevate the voices of survivors, really listening to them and, and hearing from them, what is it that they want? What supports is it that they want and how do we work together as a community to really kind of address those issues and I think you know as far as we've come there still continues to be barriers within our systems particularly for communities of color and I think until we as community members work to um, address those barriers we're going to continue to see um, similar issues so I think it's you know I I've watched over the last maybe four or five years, you know, people being more aware of the issue, being aware of the barriers and really working to um, address them both on a city level, state level, federal level. Um, and I think that's kind of where we're looking to the future is that continuing alongside of them, working alongside, coming up with innovative solutions and really continuing to address those systems um, that our communities continue to face. Yeah, well, we want to thank Yasmin for being with us and the great work that you're doing. Congratulations on your 40 year anniversary. And we would love to have you back to come and talk more about uh, the work that you're doing and the impact that it's making uh, across the city. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for having us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, Yasmin and Hamza, our guests here, and we want you to know that we've got more shows. So please don't go anywhere. We'll continue with more social justice coming up after the break.